delighted people are here. And Jenny, I can't thank you enough for, for taking this on and bringing this, these four wonderful artists together for this great community of, of folks. So take it. It's very exciting. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, my name is Jenny Zeller and I am the arts and nature curator here at Bernheim. Uh, I will be sharing my screen in just a moment, uh, but I wanna thank you for joining us for the beauty of bugs. Uh, this is, will be an exciting virtual conversation with four talented artists uh, who take inspiration from insects around us uh, to create fascinating works of art. Um, this is in conjunction, in conjunction, excuse me, with Bugapalooza, uh, which is a new twist on an old Bernheim event called Bugfest, uh, which was a one day event. Uh, which is now expanded into a week-long hybrid of virtual and in-person programming. Um, and it will culminate on Saturday between 10 and 4 at Bernheim with a number of activities geared towards the entire family uh, around the world of bugs. Uh, I do ask, and it looks like everybody here is good, just that you keep yourself on mute uh, throughout the event. Uh, but please use the chat uh, feature uh, to put questions in throughout the presentations uh, as we go. And then either Ren or myself will we'll kind of get those answered for you. Uh, we will go for one hour. Um, and I just wanted to give a huge thanks to Ren Smith. She is Bernheim's Interpretive Programs Manager. She is truly the driving force behind Bugapalooza. Uh, and she is co-hosting this event as well. So let me go ahead and share my screen and we will jump on in here. Okay. So again, welcome to the beauty of bugs. This is a beautiful image by one of our participating artists tonight, Shannon Amadon. Uh, let's see, there, there's people from all over. So I just kind of want to go into a little bit, a uh, brief overview about Bernheim and who we are in case you are new to us. Uh, you know, Bernheim is a nonprofit, educational and recreational nature preserve. <clears throat> We're located 25 miles south of Louisville, Kentucky in, in Claremont, Kentucky. Uh, we are a 16,140 acre forest. Uh, we are the largest area of private protected land east of the Mississippi River. We are home to unique nature-based uh, fun-filled programs and year-round events. We are a destination for more than 400,000 visitors annually. Uh, we are home to over 900 species of plants. We are a nationally recognized 600 acre arboretum. We have large expanses of scenic woodlands with over 40 miles of hiking trails. And we are a place of artistic expression for artists from around the world. So our mission is connecting people to nature and we have do, been doing that successfully since 1929. And we do that through a number of lenses, one of which is nature-based education. We do this through regenerative design and sustainable landscapes. Uh, we do this through research, land stewardship and conservation. And we do this through play and the Children of Play Network. If you haven't been out to Bernheim, you must come out to see uh, our new natural children's playground called Playco System. It is quite fabulous. And of course, we do this through arts and nature. Uh, before we kind of get into the introduction of the artist tonight, I just, as I said earlier, this is in conjunction with Bugapalooza, which is happening this week at Bernheim. Uh, go to the link bernheim.org bu slash bugs. Uh, to see all the events that you can participate in, uh, both virtually and online. I did want to highlight a few in-person events coming up this week. We have a bug concert with Mr. Dan. This will be Friday at 11 a.m. This will be at our newly installed Spirit Nest, 
which is in zone two of Playco system. And then of course, the main event taking place Saturday between 10 and four. So without further ado, I'm gonna jump into the artists. I'm going to just give a brief overview. Am I on mute? No, I'm not. Okay, perfect, sorry. <laughs> I just had a, a flash there of nervousness. Um, so yes, our, the first artist presenting tonight is Shannon Amadon. Uh, Shannon is an artist, environmental steward, beekeeper, lover of books, insects, and paper ephemera. Uh, she is joining us tonight from Troutsdale, Oregon. Uh, she creates luminous and caustic paintings and installations that are inspired by the briefness of life and wonders of the natural world. So I'll be dropping links to all the artists' websites, Instagrams, et cetera, as we go through tonight. We also have Angel Yoon Chung Chiao, and she is a Korean American artist and designer. She's interested in the transformative quality of arts. She has a background in graphic design, painting, and pottery. Uh, she is joining us this evening from Barcelona, Spain. Uh, she was living in Louisville and she is in Barcelona now uh, pursuing a master's degree. Uh, so thank you so much for staying up late for us tonight. Um, she's going to be talking to us about facing her fear of insects and joining a collaborative 100 day project where she drew an insect a day for 100 days. We also have Bob Drake who is a sound artist, improvising musician, composer, stringed instrument maker. Uh, he's joining us from Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, he is, he will be discussing recent sound installations created around the periodical cicada emergences uh, in and around this region. And then we have Joanne Price. Uh, Many people may know Joanne. Uh, she has been a featured artist at Bug Fest in years past, doing lots of wonderful activities. Um, she's also was part of our Local Use by Local Artists program in 2014, where she was able to uh, photograph bugs from our specimen collection in the creation of this beautiful uh, series called Beneficial Insects. She'll be talking a little bit about that tonight as well as other works. And Joanne will actually be joining us in person again on Sunday where she will be uh, creating some really cool murals uh, okay. collaboratively. Yes, yes. Oh, what did I say? You said Sunday. It's Saturday. Oh, I meant Saturday. Sorry, folks. That's all right. Um, without further ado, I am going to pass pass the baton to Shannon uh, to get started with her presentation. And I just wanna say, I love how the pandemic has sort of brought us all together. Um, we're able to uh, expand our horizons a bit and, and reach different audiences and invite artists from other places. So I do love that. Me too. I think that's one of the best parts uh, of this pandemic. <laughs> um, I will say, I for me, I can't quite see the full screen. So okay. I don't know if there's a view option where you can adjust that. Uh, can you see? Um, let's see. Share screen sharing. Hmm. You, can you see? Um, maybe it's just my personal view options. Okay, I'm good to go. Is that so better? If anybody, yeah, if anybody has trouble seeing, you can adjust that on the view options at the top okay. of your screen. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Shannon. Um, thank you so much, Jenny, for having me here and Joanne for recommending me. I really appreciate this. And I'm really excited about this because I'm very passionate about insects. I am a professional visual artist and a beekeeper living in the Pacific Northwest. And my medium is encaustic, which is a combination of beeswax and damar resin, which is a tree sap. And that makes a clear kind of medium. And if I want to add color to that, I use natural earth pigments 
And I used, also use a lot of uh, vintage paper ephemera, like book pages and letters in my artwork. And a really important aspect of my artwork is creating in a sustainable and environmentally friendly way. So I try to use all natural materials and upcycle and recycle whatever I can in my process. And I've been fascinated with insects for as long as I could remember. I really love their life cycles, and I think they're just beautiful and so uh, just so interesting. And every time I see a new and different insect, I just get really excited. And something that I do um, think is important is to study with different scientists and researchers and other artists. And I've had the opportunity to attend some research um, programs. That's where I actually met Joanne. And um, get to study with different entomologists and artists, and it really helps um, add to my art practice and gives me lots of inspiration and materials. As you can see, I use a lot of um, insect imagery in my artwork. These uh, four paintings are enlarged insect wings. They're about 48 inches tall, and they're a dobson fly, a mosquito, a dragonfly, and a cicada, and they're all done painted with encaustic. And um, I know a lot of people probably don't necessarily think mosquito, mosquitoes or mosquito wings are beautiful or interesting, but one of the things that I try to do with my artwork is inform everyone of the benefits of all insects, even ones that we may think are pests, um, have benefits. They, like, For example, mosquitoes are so important to the food chain and biodiversity. They, you know, feed insect or feed bats and amphibians and, and fish. And so they also are some pollinators. So I think it's important to be open-minded to all, all different insects, not just the beautiful ones um, that people are most um, known. Um, bees are another insect that are really fascinating to me. Um, when I started painting with encaustic and beeswax, I really wanted to learn more about where my medium was coming from. So I started studying beekeeping at Oregon State University and learning as much as I can about bees and their life cycles and their process. And I started keeping bees and it's been really beneficial to my art practice and just um, really respecting and understanding that the medium that I use is dependent upon these creatures um, that are also in decline. So it's been a great experience. One of my other favorite insects is moths. I know a lot of butterflies get a lot of attention, but I think moths are absolutely fascinating and beautiful. And I like to um, use them a lot in my artwork. And this particular painting is called Moth and Myth. And it's also an encaustic painting with a 24 karat gold leaf. And I have a Luna moth and a Cecropia and an Emperor moth. And I really like to include different types of moths in my work. And one of the things I think is so fascinating about moths is a lot of them um, aren't, don't have mouth parts or they don't eat. They do all of their eating while they're caterpillars. And after they emerge, their um, only real mission is to mate and lay eggs and, and reproduce. And I think that's beautiful and tragic in a way, but I think it's also really fascinating and something a lot of people don't know. And they're also um, pollinators and they pollinate a lot at night and their hairy bodies are really good for that. Another aspect that my work that I is really important is education. So I try to, as well as, you know, um, portray these different insects as educate um, my viewers and collectors about the different um, decline of insects. And this piece is called Coalescence, and it's a 300 piece encaustic installation of um, blown up and close up monarch butterfly wings. And the Western monarch population since the 1980s has declined 99%. It's just been decimated. And when I heard that statistic through the Xerxes Society, I was just blown away. The Eastern monarch is doing a little bit better, but not much. And I remember as a child um, living in California, growing up in California, seeing the monarch migration come through our yard. And it was just magical and beautiful to witness that. But every year it became less and less until there are no monarchs at all. And the problems that they're facing, the one of the big ones is um, the habitat destruction, climate change and pesticides. So I think it's really important for me to portray this through my work as well. Last year, 
when the pandemic just started, I was feeling really um, disconnected and, and lonely. You know, we were all in lockdown. So I decided to create a new 30 day project. One of the things that I really love is connecting with people through mail and letters. So I decided to um, start this 30 day art project called Postal Entomology. And each day I created a new piece with a different insect on it on a vintage postcard or envelope. And I would share um, facts about that insect on my social media. And then I would send these postcards out to people all over the US and Canada. And after the 30 days, I did it during April last year, which was also National Letter Writing Month. I, um, I created a book that was same title, Postal Entomology, 30 Days of Art and Letters. And I included images of the artwork. And I also created my own little postmark with the um, dates that I created the piece and the title of the piece. And it was a really nice way to um, conclude this 30 day art project. So um, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. I think we're going to do questions at the end, if that's OK, just so we can kind of keep moving. But yes, please put questions in the chat and uh, we'll address them after all four artists present. Uh, next up is Angel. And I said I would start putting links in, so I'm going to do that. Hi, I'm gonna try to share my screen. Please let me know if I'm unsuccessful. Good. All right, um, so thank you for your presentation, Shannon. It was so inspiring and I feel like I just learned a bunch um, of things about insects. So it was, and thanks Jenny and Bernheim for having me as a part of this event. Um, it's a little bit late, but I'm really happy to be joining and sharing my work with you guys. So, um, I'm an artist and a designer and a ceramicist. I'm from California. I lived in Louisville for the past five years and now I'm in Barcelona, Spain, pursuing my master's degree in design and technology. Um, and today I'm gonna to be sharing about my 100 day project that I did this year. It's called 100 Days of Facing My Enemy. And um, unlike Shannon, I've always had a fear of insects ever since I was young. I, they, they are very fascinating, but I always had this aversion to them that I couldn't explain why. Um, and earlier this year, I joined a 100-day project community, and it's a virtual community of creative people committed to doing one thing a day, uh, doing a project every day for 100 days. And it could be anything from writing to music to drawing. Um, and we met virtually every day for 30 minutes a day, uh, which encouraged and kept everyone accountable. And I took this opportunity to um, face my fear of insects. And what better way to face my fear than to sit with them and observe them every single day. So I ended up drawing 100 insects. And another part of the project is that I decided to draw with my left hand. <clears throat> And the reason behind this was I wanted to let go of the idea of creating something that looked perfect or looked good, which is a tendency I have when I'm drawing or designing. And I wanted to focus more on the act of observing and the process of drawing. So a little bit about my process. Um, I found this awesome website called insectidentification.org. And I would look on this website and choose an insect that just looked visually interesting. And um, this website also categorizes by a bunch of different categories, including the primary color, which is cool. I started using a bamboo nib pen, a sumi ink, uh, which is a Japanese ink made from pinewood suit and watercolor. Um, I kept all the drawings under 15 minutes, which helped me commit to them every single day. So these first few drawings, I became really happy with the outcome. And I was noticing myself getting a little bit better and better with drawing my with my left hand. 
um, and found myself also falling into the same trap of making things, uh, focusing too much on the outcome and making things look good. So I decided to change things up um, a third of the way through. And this was around February in Louisville and there was a big snowstorm. Um, I found these wonderful icicles in my backyard, which appeared like great drawing tools. So I picked one and started using one for drawing. Um, and this process turned out to be so much more interesting for me, uh, interesting and fun for me. Um, it was using an unfamiliar tool that I've never drawn with before. Uh, I had less control over it. It was cold, it was melting fast. So I had to draw fast and the, the melting water kind of pulled and gave unexpected outcomes of the drawing. So I really um, was excited by this new idea of picking up different tools and being surprised by the outcome of what they could, uh, what the outcome of what the drawing would be. So I, from here, I started looking around the house and on walks anywhere kind of I was to look for interesting tools that I could use for drawing. Um, this video, I'm using a used toothbrush to draw a Southern Devil Scorpion. And the tools brought a lot of different character and characteristics out of the drawings that normally I wouldn't have um, thought of. And another aspect of this project was I was posting on Instagram every day as I was going. So was, I was posting these process videos along with the final images and the source image that I was drawing from. Um, and I was getting a lot of community feedback, which is how I discovered some insect macro photography people on Instagram. Um, and they, they're, I found these pages from all over the world and they had insects uh, like really close up shots of insects that were super beautiful and colorful and at, from angles and perspectives that I would have never seen before. So I fell in love with these accounts and I messaged some of them and reached out um, to ask if I could use some of these photographs as a source for my drawings. Um, and this turned into a new kind of collaboration and engagement that I hadn't imagined that the project would take on before. So this video, I'm drawing a hawk moth, which is super cool with um, a dandelion flower. So in conclusion, um, I did not get over my fear of insects. <laughs> but I did grow my appreciation for the beauty and diversity of insects. Um, and as an artist through this practice, I feel like I've loosened up and trying to make things look perfect and kind of embrace the evolving process of ups and downs um, and finding ways to make the process more interesting for myself as well. And these are some of the other objects that I've used to draw some insects and you could find a lot more process videos on my Instagram and on my website. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. That was beautiful. I love seeing those videos and just the fact that you're exploring a totally different medium than, than you're used to uh, doing at this moment in time. So good for you. All right, next up is Bob Drake. Howdy. Howdy, thank you. I'm going to try to share my screen as well. Let's see if I can make this work. There we go. Okay, thanks. Thanks, uh, Jen and Ren and the, the whole crew for, for this opportunity. I really appreciate uh, having some time to talk about uh, art and insects. So my name is Bob Drake. I'm a sound artist in Cleveland, Ohio. When I call myself a sound artist, it means I'm working with listening and sound as, as a material. 
like a sculpture does, a, a thing that you can interact with in space rather than music which happens in time. So uh, a lot of my sound art work, uh, sound art in general, is uh, sculptures and immersive installations and things like that. And uh, when I teach sound art at the Cleveland Institute of Art, it's part of the sculpture department. Bugs. I love the bugs. So I wanted to share a couple of projects that I've done specific to the uh, periodic cicadas that appear in uh, various parts of the country every 13 or 17 years. It's this amazing, dramatic, natural sonic event with all these creatures all coming out at once, just making a lot of noise and trying to find love. And I find them so inspiring. Um, my apologies to the naturalists amongst you, because some of you may obviously uh, know this, but they appear uh, someplace in the United States every year. There was some, a lot of news stories about this is their, the big occurrence. It happens every year, just different places. Right? And uh, it's, it's believed that uh, popping up in different places like that helps them avoid predators. Uh, this year, Brood X emerged in a couple of places. Uh, Western Ohio, uh, most of Indiana, uh, some some parts of Kentucky, as well as some places over on the East Coast. And I think between being close to uh, some big population centers and maybe us all being a little stir crazy at home, they just got a lot of press. And uh, uh, I did come down to Bernheim looking for them uh, as I go as I travel around, and I did hear some uh, in Bernheim. But if you got closer to the Ohio River. Uh, you would have gotten an earful because they were plentiful. So I do a lot of sound recording and incorporating natural sounds uh, into my recorded installation work. And uh, back in 2016 when the Brood 5 cicadas had their emergence in my area, I was just blown away. Uh, maybe you got to he hear them uh, this time. I'm going to try to play a little bit. Let's see. Now this is going on at about 95 decibels, uh, which is a small rock concert. Uh, there are literally millions and millions of bugs out there. Uh, let's stop that. Um, and it's just overwhelming. So, uh, so back in 2016, I incorporated those field recordings into performances, recorded work, and eventually made a eight-channel uh, sound environment at Satellite Gallery in Cleveland, uh, attempting to try, try to recapture some of that uh, three-dimensional, all-encompassing all uh, wall of sound. Uh, and, and it was uh, fairly successful, and I was pretty happy with it. Then. See, fast forward to uh, this year, 2021, and all the, these news stories started. First it was millions of cicadas, and, and then it was billions of cicadas, and they, they were just hyping it up. And I started getting a lot of questions through social media from the websites that I'd set up uh, for my previous projects about are we going to see them, and what, what's the story. Um, and obviously they were not around Ohio, uh, northern, northeastern Ohio, uh, but I travel around uh, every year and try to try to hear them again, just because I love them so much. I'd also started working with uh, what's called geolocated media, which is uh, media that uh, takes advantage of uh, an app on your phone to use GPS to determine where you are, and then based on your your physical position uh, on the planet, it can play back sounds, or, or, and folks use that for uh, interpretive work. Uh, they do uh, kind of uh, storytelling uh, in, in situ, uh, kind of self-guided tours. Um, so I decided to create a sound walk, it was called Shadows of Brood V, Brood 5, uh, in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park near where I live. Uh, kind of folks that were hearing about cicadas but couldn't hear them and remembered hearing them five years ago. And, uh, and uh, 
here's a little bit how it works. So, uh, let's see, I'm going to, there we go. I'm, I'm, I'm so what happens is you can, on a map, create active areas that when someone enters them, uh, walking, uh, it triggers the sound to start playing. Uh, and here's a little bit of how that works. Oh. My f apologies for When you open the app, it displays available sound walks in your area. Clicking on the cicada sound walk, there's some introductory information and a map of the area with your location indicated by a marker and colored circles to show areas that have associated sounds. Starting the sound walk begins playing the cicada sounds for the area you are in. As you walk from one area to another, you trigger new cicada sounds. So a couple of hundred uh, listeners, visitors, have experienced that sound walk, and it's still active. If you happen to be in Northeast Ohio, I think uh, Jenny is going to put in a link to my web page that has a link to that stuff. And uh, I just wanted to close with a, kind of a short reminisce. Back in uh, 2016, when I was making these, what is... There we go. Apologies for this jumpy stuff. Back in 2016 when I was making those recorders, uh, I'm down in the park. Uh, I'm stopped in the parking lot, and this charming kind of stereotypical Audubon Society lady in a floppy hat and khaki shorts and binoculars comes up, and she says, Excuse me, you might not realize it, but there's this truly amazing thing happening in our park right just now. The 17 year cicadas have come out and they're starting to sing. And if you go down just by that clump of trees, you can hear them. And she, she handed me a pamphlet, like a, like a, a, a religious uh, proselytizer trying to convert me. A and in my head, I'm, I'm shouting, but I'm like, you, see, you love the cicadas. I love the cicadas. We're, we're, we're compadres. You know, we started trading cicada stories and, and talking and chatting up and uh, having a great time. And as the conversation continues, you know, she says, you know, I'm 72, and I probably won't be here the next time they come around. You know, it wasn't dramatic or, or sad or anything. It's just, just facts of life. So we will go off and listen to cicadas. But I like that story, and I, I love that woman, because it reminds me Stop, smell the roses, and listen to the bugs while we still can. So, thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Bob. That was really awesome. Really awesome. All right, last but not least, we have Joanne Price. Hello. I will attempt the screen share here. Let's see, Bob, can you mute yourself? Can you mute yourself? Beautiful. Thank you. Okay, so I have um, a bit of a narrative that I probably will be rushing through, but I'm going to try and uh, get through. Um, so, um, so a, a wild, dark place. So when um, my partner and I moved from Minneapolis to Kentucky in 2012, uh, my partner, a NASA solar system ambassador, wanted a place where he could just walk out and look up at a less light polluted sky. Our dark sky map guided our search and we found a home with five acres in Baghdad, Kentucky. Joanne, I'm gonna interrupt you briefly. Yeah. 
we, we can see like presentation mode. Are you able to pull it up with the slides? Um, possibly, hang on one sec. Sorry, I just know that okay. your images are so beautiful. We just wanna see them as, as big as we can. And if not, that's totally fine. How is that? I'm still no. seeing it in, yeah. So I'm seeing like your next slide and the slides at the bottom. How about that? I'm not quite sure yet. I'm not seeing anything. Can anybody else give me a shake? Of, okay. Hmm. Well, I think let's do hey. what we can. <laughs> well, hang on one sec. Let me um, try. I'm gonna stop screen share and then I'll try again. Okay. And there's no need to rush your presentation, by the way. Okay. <laughs> oh, so it's slideshow. Uh, yes, beautiful, perfect, okay. perfect. Okay, I'm it just needed to myself. reset itself. Okay. So um, to the next um, slide here. So in addition to our new wildflower patches, I especially enjoy our ancient trees, the beginnings of a small forest and feeling connected to nature as in childhood, exploring the forest, meadows, and mowed paths. We called them bunny trails um, every summer weekend at my grandparents' cabin in Western New York. So this here is our little barn. This is our wild place. Moving to rural Kentucky provided an opportunity to focus more on my art. So I created Starpoint Studio in 2013. My studio houses two motorized clamshell presses uh, and one cylinder proof press. Uh, these are cutting edge 19th century technology. Farmers love it and so do I. We have alien creatures that are found around the yard and in the garden that spur curiosity and research. Are these good or bad bugs? I use insect identification books, and I learned of iNaturalist a couple of years ago, a virtual community of uh, citizen scientists, biologists, amateurs, and naturalists that encourage sharing and mapping observations through um, photographs, which is great. Um, this project um, that I'm going to show you next um, has had lots of help. Um, I started a project, um, as uh, Jenny had mentioned, as a regional artist um, in residence at Bernheim. And um, I had access to their insect collection, which I photographed and I did drawings. And I also um, had a lot of experiences walking through the meadows and on the trails through the forest um, and kind of uh, creating a narrative that this um, uh, project grows out of. So this project that I'm referring to is a beneficial insects project. Um, and uh, I'm presenting it as an artist book. Um, it will include 10 engraved illustrations of insects with very brief info about their life cycle, common and scientific names and behavior. So what are beneficial insects? Well, um, the definition I have settled on is beneficial insects are insects that pollinate trees and plant life um, while they collect nectar from flowers. Insects that are predators of undesirable destructive insects are also seen as beneficial to human activities. There are many more benefit, beneficial insects than what I have included in my book, um, but you can count on dragonflies, parasitic wasps, pollinators, um, assassin bugs, spiders, and house centipedes to benefit you in your garden, yard, and house. But of course, these definitions are very subjective. Um, so you see here the yellow garden spider, always a favorite. Um, we had them in our yard almost every year up until just last year. Um, so here um, uh, you can see the wheel bugs, which are some of my favorites. Um, they have such curious back hardware. Uh, they're like little mi miniature dinosaurs. Um, wheel bugs inject their prey with something that liquefies the tissue so they can slurp them out there through a straw-like bendable beak, which is crazy, right? Um, so I'm gonna show you a little bit about the process here of how these are made. Um, I mainly do relief printmaking. Um, the process works much like a stamp. 
Um, here you can see each color is printed separately, one at a time in progression from light to dark. First the yellow, then blue. The light green is the result of transparent blue over yellow, optically mixing to create the green. Then red from a separate plate, then a dark blue green, and finally a dark warm brown. The text is added um, from a separate plate. So um, I also have help not just from uh, residencies, but also um, a beneficial insects collaborator, um, Bernheim's own uh, research biologist, Kelly Vowles, um, submitted text for this book. Uh, so that I have some semblance of scientific accuracy. I am still an amateur. <laughs> um, here we have some pollinators. So more help along the way for this project. Um, I was a resident um, artist at the Minnesota Center for Book Arts for a couple of weeks, and they provided the springboard for the book structure and sketches, setting me up for a big boost from the Kentucky Foundation for Women's artistic enrichment grant that got me 75% of the way through the projects. So the images that I have um, left to do for this project are, are the robber fly, a house centipede, and a decomposing critter, maybe an ant, or maybe ants or maybe snails. I haven't decided yet. Um, so the Beneficial Insects Project has been set aside many times to take on commissions and other inspired paths that are related, but not necessarily part of the project. So one, one such dalliance is um, this piece here, Aurelis Christatus Epic. Um, and it was part of a portfolio called Wondrous Transformation and Peculiar Nourishment, celebrating the engravings of Maria Sibylla Marion. So inspired by Marion's illustrations, in study of insects, I show the life cycle of the wheel bug while combining different perspectives, like an overhead map-like view of the Ohio River and the Milky, Way, Milky Way's River of Stars. Light pollution is seen on the horizon and agriculture's mark on the landscape, but still I can find a wheel bug in my garden. So um, another uh, kind of boost to this project and to these interests, um, I got a grant through the Great Meadows Foundation that brought me to Ayatana Artist Research Program in Canada. And that's where I met Shannon uh, there. And you can see her in the picture um, as we were studying insects through microscopes. Um, we did actually look and I recorded um, a scene, a specimen that we collected from the field. Um, I don't know if you remember this, Shannon, but I think it was, uh, uh, well, it was a, a ladybug larva that was eating a bunch of aphids. It was amazing and gruesome and so cool. Uh, this particular video that I'm taking here was um, uh, a, a pustulated carrion beetle that I found um, in my house. <laughs> awesome. And I happened to notice things crawling on it. So of course, I have a microscope now because of Ayatana <laughs> and, uh, and also Bernheim. Uh, and so I had to take a peek and see what was going on. So apparently these mites hitch a ride on the beetle so that um, they can get a ride to the next um, carcass um, or snake egg, so, which apparently carry on beetles parasitize. So insects are amazing, right? Okay, so now that you're sufficiently creeped out, um, <laughs> after my Ayatana experience, I altered a large wo uh, woodcut that I had done to include my thoughts on the alarming global insect population decline. By cutting the shapes of moths, I wanted to play with the idea of light pollution and how it was affecting both insects and bird migrations. Um, the cut shapes create a play with light and shadow, conveying the idea of presence and absence while maintaining a feeling of movement. A few of the cut shapes are sewn back onto the paper and some are scattered below the piece. The main subject of the woodcut is a spawning event of mayflies and the resulting spring feast for swallows that I witnessed in 2014 along the shore of the Ohio River in Louisville. So I'm still processing swarm, you know, you know, almost two years later. Um, 
but I'm always looking forward to re-engaging with my Beneficial Insects um, artist book with renewed interest, stories, and energy. Because of course, I always still see a bunch of things happening in my yard that um, that spur me, you know, like that uh, firefly image that you saw on the first slide. So um, in conclusion, just um, I have uh, this image of um, some stencil painting that I did in my kitchen, and um, I wanted to tie it in to the in-person event at Bernheim on Saturday um, from one to four um, so that uh, we can create a collaborative community project, an insect themed mural with stencils and paint. So, thanks. I also point out too in the left top of the, of the door frame, you can see the approaching praying mantis. <laughs> Joanne, that was awesome. Thank you. Thank I, you. I hate it that you couldn't hear me laughing at your oh. jokes. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you. Um, if you would stop sharing your screen so we can kind of see everybody again, that would be perfect. Thank you. Um, tons of great comments in the chat if you've had to look at it. Uh, really about every artist that's presenting, um, just saying the work is stunning, love it, wonderful. Um, so yes, thank you everybody for, yes, you've been laughing too, Kristen. I love it, thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions? You can put it in the chat. You can um, unmute yourself and ask if that's what, if you feel comfortable doing so. We, I, I probably gave a little bit too long of a presentation to start and we're, we're closing in on 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Um, however, we could, we could stay over a little bit if, if everybody is up for that. Um, I do have a question for Joanne. Uh, where can we follow your book project and find a copy once it's complete? <clears throat> well, uh... I'm not sure when it will be complete. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, you know, I sneak a little bits of time here and there to work on the last three um, illustrations, but um, you can find me at starpointstudio.com. Um, I'm also on Instagram as at starpointstudio. Um, and I'm on Facebook, uh, Starpoint Studio, Joanne Price. Um, and I'm also on Twitter, is star point price. <laughs> Cover all the bases there. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think probably the most updates you're gonna get, like even the little stuff is probably gonna be on Instagram or Facebook um, or you know one of the social media, you know, take your pick. So. so Bob, what was it about cicadas that drew you there? initially. You know, I was, uh, I, I had remembered we were driving my uh, daughter uh, back and forth to Columbus uh, 22 years ago now. And we stopped at a rest stop and this, uh, brood V, brood five cicadas were, were out. I'd never experienced them. And you when you looked at a tree there was more bug than bark it was so dense there were millions and millions of bugs and it just it just blew my mind and it was, uh, like, and, and so uh, so when they came came around the next time 17 years later i was ready for them very cool thank you Angel, I was curious if you were planning to continue drawing and drawing in this fashion. And I know that you said you're not quite sure you faced your fear of insects, but did it change? Um, that's a great question. I, I think after doing and completing the 100 day project this year, it's something that I want to consider doing to some extent every year. Um, I feel like because I work in design and I study design, I get to draw less and less unless I have kind of make a project out of it or 
make an assignment for myself to do it. Um, and as for the, the fear of insects, I, so it's, it's pretty complex. Like listening to everyone talk today, I'm so fascinated. And I, I was so interested in all of the details um, of the insects, but I do, ha I have this thing called tryptophobia, which is a fear of like small dots in one place <laughs> that's kind of linked to my aversion to insects so um yeah I don't know I don't know what it hasn't changed um but I think the appreciation part of it grew through this project beautiful thank you and Shannon, one thing I found so amazing about your work is just the actual medium itself, you know, the incorporation of beeswax, um, the sap, the Damar resin. Um, I've worked with encaustic wax before. So, I mean, that process is so cool and, and very interactive as well. I don't know if you want to maybe talk about that a little bit and its connection to the natural world. Oh, yeah. It's a, I love the medium because it's so, um, it has so many, uh, you hit all the senses, the, it's the heat from the wax and the smell of the beeswax is wonderful and it creates really great texture and depth. And I love it because you can build up these layers of luminosity and you could embed things in these layers. And these, I love having like areas where things are revealed and then things are obscured. And it's, you know, it's, this, it's a very, actually a very old medium, like going back to ancient Egypt and the Romans used to use it. So it's really wonderful that it's kind of having this resurgence and that it is, um, to me, at least like it's a more natural medium, you know, with the using the beeswax and the resin and the, the earth pigments. Um, the only one thing that's a little bit not great is it does take a, a lot of energy because you have to melt the wax and keep it heated. So thinking about your energy use, but it's just such a tactile and, and wonderful medium. I definitely encourage everyone to try it out. It could be a little bit intimidating, but you do get to use a torch and like fire. So that's always fun. Excellent. Uh, Ren made the comment that she loves your earrings, Shannon. Thank you, thank <laughs> you. Yeah, the cicadas. I love cicadas too, so I'm definitely, I have a cicada tattoo and a Luna tattoo, so. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, this is a uh, question open to all artists. Uh, so how can art assist with the fear of bugs that is so prevalent today? And any one of the four of you can start. I had just put in the chat uh, that education and exposure, I think, are probably are, at least for me, a main tool, like, you know, just telling people about like, oh, don't squash that spider. It's doing us a service or, um, yeah, it looks kind of crazy, but look at it really close. Isn't that cool? <laughs> that's my, that's my approach. Yeah, I definitely think that learning about the functionality and that they like that every insect has a purpose similar to, you know, something that we could relate to has helped me kind of think about them and look at them in a different way. Yeah, for me too, also realizing how important they are in terms of, you know, there's the pollination aspect, but there's also like they break down waste for us. They are the, you know, base of the food chain. They're so important. I really think, you know, there's a lot of other endangered creatures on the planet, but people really overlook insects and that's, they're so important and beneficial to us. And kind of like Joanne was saying, like exposure and education, like when I learn like the process of something, the life cycle and what it does, it just kind of takes the fear away a little bit. And um, knowing that they really don't want to hurt us, they're just really doing their own thing. You know, it helps too. I just uh, threw a, uh, a link in the chat to a, a blog called Listening in Nature by my uh, uh, colleague here in Cleveland, Lisa Rainsong. Uh, and she writes just rapturously about uh, the sounds of insects. Um, and for me, I think that that can, could maybe be an, an, 
a way in to appreciating insects. You know, we, we appreciate bird song, um, even though you know the turkey vulture might be <laughs> kind of ugly. You know, they're they're not always always attractive uh, birds, but uh, maybe hearing the sounds of of insects could be an entree to uh, appreciating them a little more. I'm a big believer in the power of sound. Very cool. Thank you for uh, for that link. And yes, great points all around. I think I'm just going to finish with one final question, unless somebody out there wants to unmike themselves or put a question in the box. I don't want to hog this time. Several presentations kind of commented on climate change and the decline of bugs. And so I'm, I'm curious how we can educate about climate change through the world of insects, which I know is a heavy question, but if there was anybody that had thoughts on that, uh, would love to hear them. Um, I can go. Uh, so being in a rural location, I kind of see um, what, uh, you know, some of the effects in, in particular, you know, light pollution. And uh, while that's not necessarily climate change, um, it does uh, contribute to disruptions in um, migration patterns for both um, insects and for birds. Um, uh, but it also, it affects humans. Uh, light pollution because it does throw off our own um, circadian rhythms, if you will. Um, so um, I try and talk about that a lot when I am presenting my work, or I try to bring aspects of that um, into the conversation, um, just as a way to kind of, you know, point it out, because I think a lot of people don't know. In, in rural areas here in particular, um, everybody likes to have a giant light that's on all night long because somehow it makes them feel safer. Or if they have to walk out to the barn to check on their animals in the middle of the night. Um, and it's just so senseless uh, and unnecessary and harmful. So anyway, does that answer that question? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Did anybody else have a comment on that? Well, I think kind of how I mentioned like the monarch migration, um, you know, things like colder, wetter winters really affect their migration and also the heat um, affects their food and their migration. Like last month in the Pacific Northwest, we got up to 116 Fahrenheit, which is ridiculous for this part of the country. And it's um, affects insects and it affects their their food and their um, habitat. So all these things, you know, with climate change, having the extreme weather really also affects um, the insects and where they get their food and how they migrate and lay their eggs as well. And just kind of sharing that with people and letting, you know, bringing that to the um, forefront as well. I was going to add, and again, back to uh, that, a website that I posted earlier from Lisa uh, Rainsong. Uh, she has been doing some very heavy research actually uh, on um, the appearance of different singing insects at different places. Uh, the, the handsome trig, for instance, has moved uh, uh, a couple hundred miles north uh, from where it was when she first started observing them a couple twenty years ago. So certainly the interconnectedness of everything um, will change the situation for, for insects. And I think uh, habitat decline and probably chemical pollution uh, has a lot of really direct effects. But in some cases, it's different, but it's not the end. You know, cockroaches are probably going to outlive us. <laughs> um, and um, you know, it's very anthropocentric of us to think if it's bad for us, it's bad for everything. It's going to be different for everything. All incredibly excellent points.
Thank you, thank you very much. I just kind of wanted to share a few more of what was being put into the chat. There's a very active chat room. Oh, yes, Rachel, go. Sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt, Jenny. Um, I no? just would like to thank the artists for their amazing and inspiring presentations, and thank you for for your uh, for your, for organizing and 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 Ren, th thank you to everybody at Bernheim for organizing this and um, and for all of your work. And, uh, and I would like to reiterate um, what Joanne mentioned uh, just a minute ago about how uh, just how this is bugs are about collaboration and in terms of sometimes people can be scared of them, but with their collaboration, we can do so much. And, uh, and, and I think your, your work reminds us of that. So thank you so much. And I, I look forward to seeing all that you continue to do. So thank you. And, uh, and yeah, again, thank you to you all. So uh, I've so enjoyed this, um, you know, uh, event and uh, I, I just really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you, Rachel. For those of you that don't know, Rachel was a, was it 2018 Regional Artist in Residence at Bernheim uh, and, a, and a printmaker, awesome artist. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share a few last things in the chat room and then I'll set you free unless anybody has anything else that they want to add. But yes, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Awesome artist, very inspiring. Um, we can never overdo reaching out to children and young people whose lives will definitely be impacted by climate change. Their enthusiasm and concern is powerful. So. Uh, I'm really proud of the people I, the team I work with at Bernheim and, and what we do to educate people and connect them to the natural world. So with that, I want to thank each artist for their presentations, for inspiring us, for getting us excited about bugs. Yes, yes, clap. And uh, thank you to Ren for organizing Bugapalooza and for advocating for bugs. Uh, you are amazing. So thank you, everyone. Um, I've really enjoyed putting this together and I'm so grateful that you're here and we will have uh, the recorded version posted on our YouTube channel at some point in the near future. So thank, thank you, you, Jenny. Thank you, artist. I'm very inspired. And thank all of you, all of the you who um, joined us this evening. Have a lovely one. Bye, everyone. <laughs>